Let's imagine that this happens. Some kind of global catastrophe, a doomsday event. Civilization has collapsed and the vast majority of humanity has died. But some survive. And we venture outside and find ourselves in this post-apocalyptic wasteland. What now? What would you need to know? Not just to survive in the immediate aftermath, but to thrive in the long term. Could you rebuild a society for yourself and avoid another dark ages? Hey you all there virtual rafters, how are you doing? Thanks for clicking and welcome to a series on the storyline within Raft. At this point, we're entering into Chapter 2, and if you've not gotten around to Chapter 1 progress yet, I've got some story guides that include the analysis and I'll link that playlist to the previous three locations to this puzzle. The coordinates from our last post-it note from Balboa Island are punched into the receiver, so let's go! Finishing an expedition to Caravan Island is going to be our ticket to the newer desert biome, complete with new wildlife. As with other locations, it's going to have some loot, some notes, and some blueprints for wondrous raft inventions to make life better. If you've already got engines built from the plans found in the earlier chapters, they will be useful in maneuvering to this destination. There's a whole boatload to do in Caravan Town. It's a place smattered with decaying RVs and a couple of key sections to clear, so there are two strategies. Park it and run the entire thing, or use your raft to sail around the perimeter of the island to some key points. We're going to start out on the dock side of the island. You can kind of pick this out by looking for the tire bumpers all around the planks extending into the water. There's a big banner that says Bandar Kefila? May I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's hanging from the cliffs. Might want to pack along some water, some snacks, and don't forget an explosive powder made from the goo of a pufferfish. Gonna need that to launch a little project later on. I found a fantastic guide for getting through the story and raft on the Steam community, and I'll link that below. And in it is where this map came from that can be a helpful reference to navigating this rather humongous place. <laughs> Our first stop is on the docks looking for a little yellow booth marked port office. Around this small structure you'll find what looks like some jumper cables. This is part of the battery charger that you'll be able to assemble shortly in the quest progress and provides blueprints to make the invention for our rafts. So, no more batteries to throw out. Battery charger combined with biofuel tank will always ensure that you've got power. There's any number of ways to explore Caravan Town, but I'll give you some approximate directions for how to find the assorted parts and notes across this rather large quest area. From the docks, there are some stairs leading up to the cliff sides decked out with RVs, some sections which will only be accessible by zipline. So, as you explore, keep an eye out for not just the battery charger cables, but also the pieces for the zipline. Facing the docks, there are stairs to the left that lead to a puzzle involving a water pump. But first, hop onto a blue caravan with a blue ladder and check the counter for a note. Look for a nearby pallet with a blue ladder and climb onto that where you can spot a water pump that initiates the puzzle. The second note for your journal should be next to the water pump. Trustworthy stayed down below a level to adjust the hoses. The goal of this puzzle is to get a steady stream of water through the pipes to a well that's below us. The well contains the first of the zipline pieces accessible from the starting point. Once we've got what looks like to be a direct path for the water to travel, we spam the pump lever a bit to see if it's flowing enough to raise the water level at the bottom of the basin. If successful, the zipline part should float up to collect it. When climbing back down to the top of the caravan where you found the first note, Look off to the right for a broken staircase, climb that, and then around another four flights of stairs around to the corner. 
You're looking for a blue caravan, blue ladder, and the battery charger cable on top of it. The caravan next door to it also has another note. Scavenge the area for whatever else looks good because there's really not much else to find in this area. Once you're headed back down to the stairs, look for a small wooden suspension bridge. We find ourselves in what looks like a cute little makeshift shopping center for Caravan Town. You'll know you're in the right place if the RVs are laid out in a circle pattern with signs marking the storefronts. Look for the Can Good sign and the brown caravan with a red door just off to the right. Behind that, there should be a note on the counter. Back out the door and look for a blue ladder to climb to another part of the battery charger. If you look around the back sides of the pile of the caravans, there's another wooden bridge that extends to a tower of old junk. The large housing at the top of this tower has a few activities and some interesting decorations to check out. Here, you can bring the three pieces of the zip line to collect your blueprint. For now, skip it and grab the note. Climb up the gray ladder to the roof on the tower and there'll be a memorial with some articles on it. And if you haven't already, now's a good time to kill that big bird up there. I recommend browsing the lore of the articles that are posted in and on the top of the building when you're not being bullied by the bird. There's a few interesting headlines that could bait you into the storyline a little more. There are also two zip lines coming from this rooftop that connect to an island which runs parallel to a wooden bridge full of holes. Hop on one of these lines for a fast route to the next objectives. We're looking around this section of the island for a big red cylinder looking thing that's actually a rocket that's crafted by a very young island resident who is super into science. I totally approve. They've been leaving us notes all over the place. Uh, be sure to look for one near the rocket before launching with the explosive powder. If you watch the trail after takeoff, notice that it lands on a nearby column. You'll need to reach that spot next by crossing the trail of partially submerged caravans. Once on top, we find Major Tom with a B, or is that Tomb? Doll decoration item that comes loose from the crashed rocket. When picking it up, we get both a little figure and a blueprint for fireworks. It was propped up against the box that you also need to grab for a zipline part. Swim back to the shore slightly off to the right when facing the cliffs. You're looking for a small section that's stocked with bags that say onion, rice, and beans. It's inside this caravan that you'll find yet another note for our collection. We're looking for 10 documents in total by the time we're out of this abandoned city. There's not a lot else of importance in this area, but it could be scavenged for extra loot. Here's where we can go for a short swim or turn the raft around to park it closer to the final area objectives. We're opting for a swim into the beach area where Dedo's bike invention is located. Attached to it a long air hose that was invented to provide a breathing apparatus to explore the depths around the islands, but now it's full of holes. Might want to snag the note nearby before jumping into the water to follow this hose to the end of its destination. Uh, find the oxygen meter. Periodically along the trip to the bottom are stops that contain pockets of air for a breather. Pufferfish, pufferfish everywhere. 
and you can stock up on explosive goo, but they made this a bit of a dodging game on the way to the last stop in which we find a blueprint for the metal detector, along with the final zipline part and a key for the infirmary. Well, and it's back to the surface we go as fast as possible for air. We're now in the home stretch for this part of the story. There's a little backtracking to do at this point, back up to the tower with the memorials now that we've got all these zipline parts. From the bike air pump location, there are some locations to hop up onto with a combination of stairs and blue ladders that are off to the right. It should lead up to a suspension bridge that goes back across to the tower. Once inside, you can swap out your zipline pieces for two blueprints that provide both the zipline tool that you equip on your character and the pole which you can now construct for your raft. Open the inventory and drop in the zipline tool to the slots in the bag underneath the worn items, cause it's time to hop on a line to the island with the big building marked infirmary. A uh, quick snap of the space bar to unhook from the zip line and time to explore the pile of RVs for a door that can be opened with the infirmary keys that we picked up in the underwater compartment. Inside, we're looking for another note in addition to the mayor's chest key before leaving. Explore as long as you like before uh, heading back to the tower. Once you're back up there, look for a giant sign that says mayor and trace back the ropes for your ride to what looks like the city hall for Caravan Island. It's kind of neat if you consider what all these strangers collaborated to create this settlement. They had even managed to institute a form of government before abandoning the place. The circle of shops, the docks, uh, infirmary, and the many residences are evidence of what looks like a functional society could exist even in a world gone underwater. The notes tell a story about why they would give it all up. Not so willingly, but driven out by another threat that would realistically plague humans in a world without modern conveniences. Hold up, I'll get more into detail uh, about those, but I don't want to spoil it entirely for those who want to discover this piece by piece on their own. So let's just uh, get the goods in jet. We're in here to exchange the three battery charger parts and for the set of blueprints to craft it. We definitely want this for the raft, it's uh, gonna make life happier. Then find a, a big black trunk and open that with the mayor's key. Inside is the coordinates for our next adventure and the blueprints. Don't forget your commemorative mayor's hat for formal occasions. This is the last of the essential items here, but there's a tons of food, scrap, plastic, and crates everywhere. It's worth touring the land a little to find bees, honeycombs, or the island residents who still remain, the warthogs. Before I talk too much about those, spoiler warning goes here. What I've been working on for the last couple of years now is a thought experiment. Let's imagine that this has actually happened. There's been some kind of global catastrophe, a doomsday event, an apocalypse, and civilization has collapsed and the vast majority of, of, of humanity has died. But we've all survived. Hooray! Let's say that this uh, lecture theatre we're sat in right now has served as some kind of hardened bunker, and we have survived the end of the world when the rest of humanity has perished. Well, what now? What would you need to know? Not just in the short term, not just to survive, but in the long term, how could you go about rebuilding a society from scratch for yourself? What's the most important scientific understanding, the most important technological know-how that you would want to have preserved and written down 
so that knowledge doesn't get lost to history again. What book would you want in your hands that serves as some kind of quick start rebooting guide for civilization itself so you could avoid another dark ages, accelerate the recovery of civilization, and rebuild pretty much to where we've got to today of the apocalypse. Well, that's the book as a research scientist and writer that I've tried to create. I've tried to create this reboot guide for civilization itself, as a way of peering behind the scenes of how our modern world actually works, the things we just take for granted in our modern lives, and what has enabled civilization to progress and advance over the centuries and millennia of history. So what we're really talking about here is how could you do this for real? How could you do Minecraft for real? How could you start in a blank, empty landscape and gather and collect all of the raw materials and substances that you need to provide for yourself and for your, for your society and use them in combinations with each other to make the tools and the mechanisms and the chemistry that you need to support yourself. And what I'd like to focus on for this talk is how could you go about spreading the ideas that are worth spreading? If you were starting again from scratch in this post-apocalyptic hypothetical scenario, what's the technology you'd want to redevelop as quickly as possible to share your understanding amongst everyone else who survived as you recover and regrow. Now, in our history, the critical invention that revolutionized society was the invention of the printing press. Because before the printing press, if you wanted to share human ideas, if you wanted to copy knowledge and share it amongst people, the only way you could do that is by filling an entire room full of people, like we have here, and get them to copy out a book, letter by letter, in handwriting, but with scribes. And it's incredibly laborious and time-consuming and expensive. And that means that any rich, powerful people get to choose which ideas are allowed to spread. There's a choke point on history and the transmission of ideas. But with the printing press, it's almost as if knowledge itself becomes democratic. Anyone can share any ideas they like with anyone else. So what I want to share with you today is how do you go about making a book from absolute scratch? As a writer, I want to tell you how to make your own book. And this for me has been a voyage of, of personal discovery. During the, the course of this research project, I've learned an enormous amount and created a lot of objects and artifacts, which I've got to show uh, some of uh, this afternoon to show to you. Now, the four fundamental things you need for making a book kind of makes sense. You need paper, you need ink, you need little bits of letters of, of movable type, and you need a printing press. And the basic principle behind what you do here is take your movable metal type, your letters, lay them out in a nice grid to build up the, uh, the pages of text, ink those with some really nice, thick, viscous black ink, and then use a printing press to apply some firm but very even pressure to squeeze down a piece of, of paper and transfer that writing over a hundred times faster than you could ever write it out with handwriting. But if you want to make a book from scratch, this is the process you need to cover. If you're going right back to scratch of how do you make the movable type, you need to know how you cast metal. To make metal, you need to know how to smelt from ore and charcoal. If you're making ink, you need to know what ingredients go into that. And what should be clear from this simplified diagram, this is essentially the recipe for Minecraft, for making a book from scratch, what you need to gather from your natural environment and combine in different ways to print a book for yourself. And what should be clear from this diagram is just how crucial trees are, not just for providing timber for construction, for building things, but for providing the very chemistry and the substances that our society has relied upon for hundreds and thousands of years. And of course, also how important fire and the application of heat has been for things as fundamental as how do I get metal to come out 
of a rock. And just some of those encapsulated in this diagram of how you go right back to basics to make a book. And the bit I'd like to focus on for this talk is how do you cast that metal type? How do you pour molten metal into a mold, create the tiny little letters which you then arrange into the rows for printing? Now, contrary to what's commonly thought, it wasn't actually Johann Gutenberg who first invented uh, movable metal type printing. It was some monks in, in Chongju in Korea, a good 60 years before Gutenberg. And they used movable metal type to print a Buddhist text called Jikji in the year 1377. And to understand how they did that, how they printed the very first book using simple techniques, I traveled out to Korea to visit a traditional master to learn that craft of making a book from scratch, of making the movable metal type. And I've got a short video for you now that shows that process that I learned. What you're about to see is how you start from little wooden blocks with the letters engraved into them, which are packed into sand to create a sand cast, and then pouring them off the metal to make that movable metal type. There it is. So this is why the, the sand casting is such a time-consuming, laborious process, because you essentially have to build that tree, and you have to create the channel and then the branches that connect where you pour the molten metal in to the uh, mold to fill them up. This is the good bit. Molten metal. And this is what I created from that process. This is the metal type that I founded myself in Chongju and Korea. And I think this as an artifact is absolutely beautiful. It almost represents the tree of knowledge itself, cast in this, in this beautiful bronze. And the last step in that process would be to break off those individual blocks of type, each with a different character, file it down a little bit, smooth it off, and then arrange it in rows for printing. Now, one of the things that I was incredibly smug with myself when I was going through this research project of how could you start civilization from scratch and reboot if you ever had to, was I realized that in the pages of this book, I could explain to you how to make your own paper from scratch. I could explain how to make your own ink, and I could explain how to construct a rudimentary printing press. So it's almost as if within the pages of this book, it contains the genetic instructions for its own reproduction. Tongue in cheek, of course, only a single copy of the knowledge would need to survive the apocalypse. And it tells you, the book tells you how to make more books. It can replicate and divide almost like an organism. Oh, hi. Still here? Okay, it's time to get into our journal to look at these notes. If you were looking around while you were on the island, you probably found a few peculiar sights at the top of that tower. It was pretty scandalous if you could get up into the crouch position, close enough to read the subheaders of the newspaper headlines on the table inside with the plaques, 
that are below the hooks hanging down from the walls of the building. Something about hidden societies, I think, under this headline about the big ratsy race? Geez, I wonder who they might be referencing. It's not far from the one about sanctuaries in the cold. Whistleblower describes where the 1% go to escape the apocalypse. I'm pretty sure that that answers the question. Oh, and uh, how about the make them work hidden labor camp protocols exposed to follow it up? So that all seems to be about like some headlines that we might reasonably expect in a capitalist world. Not even unreasonable to think that you might someday acquire a case of food poisoning from one of the many sketchy businesses that saturate the market with products that are mass-produced from gigantic corporate supply chains where a pound of ground beef might contain the meat of several hundred different animals. It's a viable threat in everyday consumption for the residents of Caravan Town. Salmonella. Because a far bigger problem than taking a week off of work if it happened to us now, our likelihood of survival is 99% because antibiotics are readily available. A form of salmonella can come with a dose of typhoid, making it much more deadly. But life, even with a lesser version, would become difficult as the bacterial infection can be spread by contamination repeatedly by the warthogs or from human to human. Modern life means that most places are frequently under regulation to be sanitary and to prepare foods by specific regulations to avoid as many incidents as possible. Government regulation on business isn't always the worst thing that could happen. Who knows if there was such a thing happening in Caravan Town's little shops. What we know is that we can gather from Dr. Henrik Scholl's note. In it, he writes, this has been the only meat that we've had in months. I was just so happy to have it and didn't notice the butchers were getting sick. I'd managed to get enough antibiotics from Hang to treat the first few cases, but it didn't last. They're cutting the bridge connecting us to the other islands now, and uh, the others are preparing to leave. He speculates that perhaps the pigs that have been around for another century and it was careless of them to eat them. They definitely aren't friendly or too healthy looking from the examples that we found on the island. Pretty sure as players we only want to loot the leather off these things, you wouldn't want to touch the meat anyway as a collection of notes alludes to it being the cause of this island's abandonment. It's not exactly looking like the greatest these days, but if you look at the infrastructure they had going here, it was a bustling functional hub. As reference to Young Dedo's note, He's seen as just another mouse to feed. Who else has heard this phrase a lot from their authoritarian type parent? Me! I did. Shockingly, my privileged and financially well-endowed parents had complained about another mouse to feed like it was super hard. Already getting the guilt of debt bondage before double digits. Since both of his parents were useful to the community, they were welcome to stay in the village even if their son was a bit of a troublemaker, given the journal notes of a budding scientist Dedo. His genius, although a little overconfident in execution, much of the residents annoyed, seems to be to our benefit as it left us with blueprints to recreate his experiments. You'll discover that your trip following the air hose is a deep dive underwater, which was attempting to test a breathing invention much like the older atmospheric diving suits, but when too many weights were added to the boy's suit, it caused a drowning scare, and they all learned that it was the local kelp that will likely give you a stomach ache if you try to use it as a food source. That was scare number two, as Dr. Henrik feared that it was salmonella from the pigs. Dedo's mother had been carrying all the meat the family consumed, and thus their household wasn't affected. Well, unless until you count them having to give up one's home and best friend for the open water because there's nothing that could be done to protect the inhabitants from infection by now. It can only be imagined from the docks writing that they cut the bridge between the infirmary and the rest of the city to quarantine the sick, who were suffering likely from painful cramping, vomiting, and dehydration. Under such conditions, those who would be left behind would not have much of a recovery chance as we have these days. This was no less of an example of what it would look like if humans came together from regions and cultures of very diverse people and still managed to make a society that was working as a mini township of their own volition. Despite what some may believe about humans being self-interested, we're really into collaborating and, like we always have been, persistent and often unfriendly environment of natural elements. Our evolutionary drive to connect socially, support each other, 
and find hope even in difficult times. We aren't solely programmed to be out there for ourselves. Most certainly the evidence of our spirit to innovate through Dedo's scientific journal. We got to do a test on his rocket that left us with a very adorable shelf decoration. Something to remember Caravan Town by that reminds us to keep exploring. I just couldn't help but chuckle with how child billionaires get the same idea as Dedo. If the planet is flooded, then maybe space is the final frontier or the last option. Ditto has an excuse. He's a little kid. The billionaires don't. Their immature brains are just too far out there. All the way to the stratosphere and that's a viable option where we could be saving the planet from climate change. Uh, how much carbon emissions come from rockets anyway, Elon? There's two documents in the set that are more specifically about the broader story in the Reformation Project. One, a letter, and the other, an article on the Rafts towns of Indonesia. It reports that Jakarta and much of the mainland Philippines has been lost, causing locals to craft floating cities from whatever they can construct from drifting vessels. This kind of sounds like they described us. We woke up on a drifting vessel as well. Trustworthy and I have been beginning a city under construction. For some reason, we're being deemed as a possible maritime hazard by the coastal authorities. That's probably not good. This is foreshadowing, maybe? The article moves into a positive note about it being a viable living option. Right before the dar thing hits a cliffhanger and it starts talking about the rich investors making sanctuary cities. We also saw that article on the whistleblowers on the one percenters. So, was it the four men mentioned in the article? Hmm, to heck with rich people. Reference the previous video where I played that funny study about rich folk being unethical because they just are, it's a thing. One of the few pieces not composed by Dedo is by Miriam, a leader of the Reformation Project in Africa that's been brought into this plot residually, as have the rich people who have fled the project. By now we're hearing about more of the fallout of their abandonment, a theme I'm all too familiar with with my personal life, with people who are raised in an environment of wealth that isn't natural. Uh, it's Silicon Valley. There's always the fallout from how they formulate decisions bent around some calculation that only makes sense to how profitable it is. It's called logical, but calls into question if the person's using that in a colloquial sense. To whom is this logical if the context means harm or death, especially to many? Start digging around in the philosophy for a while. Caravan Island is a bit of a contradiction. There was a human investment in even if they were seen as another mouth to feed. It took a little more than money to disperse the town and leave the project for lost. Miriam wanted the reader to learn from her mistakes. She writes, Money was a thing that we used to barter. You couldn't eat it or use it to plug a hole, yet it was valued above all else. I should have stood up, but instead I let others take the blame. The rich people went south and now there's no land but rocks. <laughs> uh, maybe you can learn from my mistakes too. Plenty of rich people have added me across multiple social media accounts. Many of them introduce me as their friends, in air quotes. I would sometimes see them weekly crossing paths at mutual car club events, but I'm pretty sure all I've ever been worth to them was the photographs that I could provide of their snazzy-looking exotic cars. If I had any meaning to them, they might have cared the healthcare system in the U.S. has failed. Not that they understand the fine print on your government-issued policy. The same conversation involves them talking about purchasing vehicle modifications for their car that cost more than the surgery that I need. This makes sense in the United States, in rich car clubs. I'm just a photographer. I can decode the whole ideology that it only really aids in their ability to rationalize and abandon anything in their life that doesn't fit that ideology of what's a worthwhile investment. And it's not in humans. It's certainly not going to be in the investment in my life. Uh, yeah, that hurts my feelers just uh, a little bit. My photographs won't be missed. Geez, they couldn't have been that good. I could have already guessed my friendship had zero value, 
you can't put a price on that and calculate the revenue. And no, I don't really engage with them unless it's just an awkward cars and coffee moment anymore. But circle back around to how the change in behaviors of humans that will drive climate change, rationalization, and disregard for consequences, especially for human life, this sounds like a familiar recipe for disaster. The transition is the hardest part. Rich people aren't about to give up their $25,000 exhaust for their $700,000 car and you ain't guilting them out of removing the emissions off of it for their enjoyment. They're insistent that they've earned this because capitalism. And this isn't just my anecdotal experience, there are studies out there about the brain and their lack of empathetic accuracy. We'll get into those next time because this last note is the coordinates for another floating city, but this one wasn't likely put together with the ingenuity of people fighting for their lives on a drifting vessel out of the Philippines. It's made by those wealthy folk and it's called Tangaroa. It offers an interesting insight into why the good life maybe isn't that good. Thank you for joining us on this adventure, and until next time, Trustworthy and I wish you happy rafting! Take care, y'all, and bye bye